Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's Hot Rod Garage video. Uh, and this one is going to feature a modification I'm going to make to the front end on the uh, chopped and channeled Model A coupe that I've been featuring in several videos. In fact, I even uh, had a video in which we installed all the front end, the, all the new parts, the split wishbones, disc brakes, everything. And here's what's happened. Everything is perfect up to about 55 miles an hour and then the front end it, it starts to wander and, and it's a little spooky okay and uh, like I said at lower speeds no issue whatsoever now I tried everything I could think of uh, to correct this issue and finally I've come down to what I think is the cause and it's something that may uh, have happened to you in the past and maybe you weren't aware of what what was causing it but let me show you what I think is is making this happen now we use these shackles to connect the leaf spring to the split wishbones and in many cases that shackle is more at a 45 degree angle mine just because of the way everything fit together the shackles tend to be more vertical okay and I think that's what's causing this I believe at a, at higher speed the front end is moving independently from the frame I think those shackles are like pivots they're letting the front end move right and left and that in itself would probably be a little disconcerting but what's really spooky is that as the front end is moving left and right the steering arm here is not so as it stays exactly where it is and the front end moves back and forth the tires are being steered left and right and uh, I for some reason this doesn't seem to be evident until higher speeds maybe the front end gets light at uh, 55 miles an hour and that shifting can occur but I can tell you it's pretty darn spooky at about 55 or 60 so here's my plan and I've heard of people putting panard rods on front ends and I always thought well that's just silly because I've never needed one well I do now I think and here is my plan let me show you uh, how I'm going to uh, design this and uh, fabricate and then connect and I should add that this is really uh, just a major issue with cross steering now in cross steering the steering arm comes forward and connects to uh, the tie rod uh, horizontally okay so that your steering arm is parallel to the front end that's why as the front end moves left and right the steering arm is uh, stationary it's attached to the steering box and then it moves your steering uh, links here left and right as the frame moves now the 34 Ford that uh, I've also featured has a different type of steering it has uh, the type where the uh, steering arm comes forward straight forward and connects to a link right here that comes off of the uh, spindle so uh, it if if the front end is moving left and right that's really not such an issue as when you have cross steering okay so here is my plan I noticed that I had a little extra thread here uh, when I connected my uh, split wishbones to the front end now here I'm going to make a little uh, probably a 3 16 bracket that's going to bolt right under here and go behind with a, a little vertical tab okay I'll show you the part uh, one, once I built it and it's going to have a hole in it now I'm also going to use a piece of 5 8 inch steel rod to connect the tab on the bracket that's going to be right under here it'll be in the back and it's going to come straight across hidden by the drilled uh, I-beam front axle and then I'm going to make a triangular bracket that will bolt under here it'll be L-shaped okay there'll be a flange and then it'll drop down and the 5 8 inch rod will come over here and pivot on the end of that triangular flange so that 
the rod then can go up and down with the front end which really doesn't move all that much but it can go up and down but it is absolutely rigid so that the front end cannot move left and right it will maintain uh, the center of uh, these shackles so that they cannot move back and forth and allow that front end to drift okay so and it's going to be pretty much invisible now you could probably bolt or, or drill or weld onto your uh, I-beam but with a chrome drilled one like this uh, would you I mean I'm not gonna drill holes in this or weld on it so I'm making this strictly a bolt on a ferrule from here to over here and hidden back behind the uh, drilled uh, I-beam front end and hopefully perfectly functional I don't think it has to be really horrendously strong because I think the lateral forces are probably not not really uh, more than maybe I don't know 100 200 maybe 300 pounds of force trying to make this move so I'm gonna make it uh, like I said 5 inch 8 inch rod and I'm not gonna use heim joints so let's get started on the fabrication and uh, see what you think as I go okay first off I cut a piece of 3 16 inch of steel and made a bracket that will bolt on to that uh, 5 8 inch uh, stud that comes out of the bottom of the um, split wishbone bracket and I have the tab here with a 3 8 inch hole drilled in it. Okay, I, I could have just simply bent a tab up and had this all out of one piece but of course I didn't have the right piece of metal so I did it in two pieces but uh, I think it's going to be plenty secure. Okay, now I'm going to take that bracket that I showed you. I'm going to install it here on the exposed thread at the bottom of the big bolt that holds the uh, split wishbones to the uh, uh, front eye beam. And as you can see, it pivots a little bit. I'll have to make sure that it's aimed exactly straight over at the bracket that's going to come down from those bolts that are holding the spring to the uh, front perch. Okay, so there's step one. Uh, now I have to uh, fabricate the uh, 5 8 inch rod and I have an idea on how I'm going to make it pivot off of uh, this tab right here and I'll show that to you. Now using my cutoff wheel I cut a slot a little over an inch uh, deep into the 5 8 inch steel rod and I uh, machined up a uh, strap that fits in there tightly and uh, I drill the end with a uh, 3 8 inch hole that will match the hole right here in the uh, little tab on my bracket. Okay so next step is to weld the strap to the rod so that it is uh, essentially all one piece. There's that strap welded now to the end of the uh, 5 8 inch rod now I have to make that triangular bracket that will uh, come down from the two bolts uh, that hold the spring to the perch. Just a quick look here at how the rod with that uh, piece of strap on the end is going to be able to move up and down to allow the uh, free uh, movement of the uh, straight axle up and down as, as it bounces over speed bumps and pedestrians and uh, it's free to let that happen but it's darn sure not free to let the rod move left and right and that's going to hold that front end absolutely square uh, uh, with the frame. Okay, and I'm going to be using uh, nylock locking nuts to be sure that the uh, pressure here is snug but not too tight to allow for that pivoting. I took the dimension I made up a drawing here of what that uh, triangular bracket's going to look like with measurements. I've transferred it to a 3 16 inch sheet of steel and now I'll use the cutoff wheel to cut it out. We'll shape it, then we'll drill the two holes that will hold it up there to the uh, bottom of the spring and we'll drill the 3 8 inch hole here for the pivot that I will uh, build at the other end of the uh, 5 8 inch rod. And here's the triangular bracket all cut out. 
Uh, now I'm going to have to find my centers uh, to uh, punch and drill holes up here in this upper part, then the uh, 3 8 inch hole down below, and then I will bend it along the dotted lines so that I'll have the right angle bracket I need. Okay, here's that bracket uh, with a 90 degree bend. I scored the back just to make it a little easier to bend so I get a nice uh, sharp 90 degree corner. Now it's time to punch and a drill of the three holes necessary to finish the bracket. And here's the finished triangular brace. Uh, I'm going to go uh, paint it semi-gloss black and install it uh, right under the spring. Here's that triangular bracket painted a nice semi-gloss black. And even though the stress on this is purely lateral, I thought it best to weld in a triangular gusset on the back to reinforce it. Okay, so now it's ready to install. There, now you can see that triangular bracket is installed uh, right below the spring perch. And uh, the 3 8 inch hole is exactly horizontal uh, straight over here to the other end, uh, which is the bracket that I showed you earlier. Okay, that uh, bracket is installed. And now I need to measure center to center and find out exactly eye to eye how long uh, the panard rod needs to be. You know I really like the look of this uh, triangular bracket. Um, before the nuts were exposed uh, and it looked kind of cheesy I thought so now I can drive around uh, with my nuts concealed. Now using the same procedure that I did on the wishbone end uh, I did the triangular bracket end. Now I'm going to have to finish um, kind of cleaning up the weld a little bit and then we'll paint this and it's ready to install. And there is our panard rod all painted and ready to install. Well the panard bar is completely installed and it's completely invisible uh, from the front or even mostly from above. You can see it when you're looking straight down. Um, the only telltale clue I can see is the edge of that bracket over here on the uh, wishbone bolt. Okay, and you can see where it comes over and it pivots off of the triangular uh, bracket. Really can't see it from uh, uh, underneath. Now, <clears throat> there's a, a couple technical considerations that we should discuss. I can anticipate some questions I, that uh, from the uh, engineers in the audience. But one last thing I wanted to draw your attention to. When I first did this front end and I had to make my own steering arms, I had them to come straight back and people complained there was no Ackerman angle to them. So now I have uh, re-fabricated uh, them and if you uh, run from the pivot right here uh, across that bolt, it goes straight back to the differential between the uh, rear wheels. So now I have the proper Ackerman angle. Another complaint was you can't do two heim joints, one on top of the other. Well, this one, you can't see it. It's underneath. It's welded solid. I'm using it for a pivot. Uh, I pivoted it and put the bolt through so that it had exactly the right angle. Okay, but it is welded solid and also it cannot turn uh, because it is pinned here with this little Allen bolt. So this is all as if it were one piece. Before we go on our test drive, let's have a little tech talk here about panard rods in general. Now the one that I'm using uh, is 16 inches long, which is fairly short. And there are consequences from using a, a short panard rod, as we will see. Here's the triangular bracket uh, right under the spring perch from which it pivots. This line represents the rod. Now, as you can imagine, as the rod rises and falls with the front end, it's going to ascribe an arc. It will not rise and fall in a straight line. Now, now, panard rods are used both on front ends and rear ends. And in both cases, you would prefer that the front end and uh, rear differential rose and fell perfectly perpendicular to the road in a straight 
path. But when you use a panard rod to achieve that, you have no choice but to have both of them move in an arc like this. Now, the longer the panard rod, the less of an arc you have, the shallower that arc would be. If I uh, used a rod that was 32 inches long, uh, the arc would be uh, half as deep as this one. It would look much more like a straight line, so the longer the better when it comes to pounded rods. But I uh, was unable to uh, do that with the way the front end is set up, so I stuck with the 16 inch one. Now, let's see the consequences of that. Uh, the front end travel is limited to about one and a half inches up and down. And at one and a half inches up, the deviation from the ideal straight line is only about three thirty seconds of an inch. So when I hit a bump which can compress the front end to its full travel of one and a half inches, the front end then will move laterally due to the panard rod a little over one sixteenth of an inch, which I think will be uh, undetectable. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to drive over some speed bumps and we'll see if the if the steering wheel suddenly jerks uh, to the side then we'll know that we do have some bump steer. That's what you call this. When you hit a bump and it changes your steering it's called bump steer. So we'll have to check that out. Okay, That's one of the shortcomings of using a uh, short panard rod. So now let's go jump in the car, uh, fire it up and go find uh, some speed bumps. Also, uh, let's check to see if the front end wanders. Uh, I'm going to find some areas that have like seams in the pavement um, that are not exactly going the direction I want to go and see if the front end tries to follow them. Um, and thirdly, let's go drive it, uh, say, 65 up to 70 miles an hour and see if that uh, sort of darting and, and uh, insecurity in, in steering uh, is still exists or if this has solved it. Well, there's our first big test. We've got a speed bump here. I'm going to go over it. We'll see if the steering wheel moves. Absolutely solid. No bumps here. Seems evident. Now we'll have to get our high speed on and see if we can have good stability at around 60 miles an hour. Okay, here's test number two. As you can see, there's a seam right here on the left of my lane. in one piece and uh, the results were even better than I expected. Um, I really felt that the front end now was just totally stable and to be honest even at lower speeds now I have a lot more confidence so apparently it was it was doing its uh, the wandering and and all uh, at lower speeds it just wasn't quite as evident and or as disturbing but now I'm totally confident in the way the car steers up to well I only went up to 70 but I probably don't need to go much faster than that. 
Before I sign off, I wanted to share uh, sort of an invention that came to mind while I was working on this project. And uh, I think it would work better than a panard rod. It's simpler and there's no moving parts. Here is uh, the way I envision it. Look at, if you have your straight axle right here. You weld at the center, the very center of it, about a half inch steel rod that's probably two or three inches long. You can weld it or you could simply bolt through the straight axle. Now this is looking down on the top from behind if this is the front of the axle you see the rod then protrudes back toward the rear of the car. Now instead of the triangular uh, bracket that I made with a hole at the bottom for the panard rod to pivot on you mill out a slot exactly the same width as this stud. Okay then when the stud has fit into the slot the, as you can see, the front end then uh, can travel up and down, but it cannot move left and right. The slot would have to be tall enough to allow for the full compression of the front end and have to be low enough to uh, allow for the full decompression of the front axle. But, to me, this, this is perfect because you have the perfect vertical travel of your front end. There's no arcs. Okay, there's no moving parts. Uh, and uh, it would be virtually invisible and fairly simple to do. So now I haven't patented this uh, and for all I know somebody else already thought of it. But if any of you want to give this a try, be my guest. Let me know how it turns out. Okay, if I build another uh, car, another hot rod with a solid uh, front axle, I'm going to do this. And I bet you it works great. Okay, so that's it. And that's it for this video and this uh, project. I hope you enjoyed it and that you will stay tuned for future videos. If you did like it, please subscribe. We're trying to get our subscription numbers up. And uh, let uh, just know for sure that we wish you the very best in health and happiness. And please stay tuned. And we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.